Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Missoula Art Museum. I'm Brandon Ranchus, the senior curator. You have the, the pleasure of uh, a wonderful event tonight that warrants not one, but two introductions. My introduction is two pages long and goes into great detail, mostly about Christy Hager. Um, this exhibition tonight uh, that you're sitting in is Christy's work, and it's really the result of a, a, a lifetime of dedication taking these photographs. And we're really grateful to the Foundation for Montana History that provided the funding um, for us to be able to print, and mat, and frame these pieces, and also to give Christy a little bit of an honoraria for her time. It's, it really was a, a community project uh, involving many different people. As many um, of you know that this work grew out of her uh, job documenting historic structures, the Historic American Building Survey, and the Historic American Engineering Record, Caps and hair using a large four by five camera. Many of the pieces um, are in the Library of Congress. And so you can kind of look at the labels and see as part of our public domain, which I think is just incredible. These images form part of our um, part of our community and part of our, our collective understanding of the state of Montana. Uh, Christy earned her BA in architecture initially from the University of Pennsylvania and received her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she's received numerous art accolades like the Gottlieb Foundation Individual Support Grant uh, for 20 years of artistic achievement, as well as the Montana Arts Council's Innovation Award. Both of those are really prestigious. And um, in addition, I wanted to mention that this exhibition is going to travel the state for the next three years uh, to different places through an organization called MAGDA, which is the Museum um, Montana Art Gallery Directors Association, MAGDA. So it's pretty fantastic that we were able to use this and then send it around and share it through the state. I think it's really interesting to think about these images of the state of Montana uh, and what we do is um, we always start with the land acknowledgement and the land acknowledgement we say is um, this make the Missoula Art Museum. We are sited on the traditional ancestral territories of the Salish and Kalispa people. We sit 20 miles south of uh, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And I think that's really an important acknowledgement, you know, here in this five valleys. It sounds a little bit like a, a road land acknowledgement. But when you look around the room and you think all of these um, sites that Christie photographed, this is all indigenous territory. And it wasn't that long ago uh, that you didn't see structures like this. You saw different kinds of structures. And it's kind of a sea change to think about it that way. I hadn't really thought about the exhibition in that context before, but I think it's um, really interesting. The um, we do a couple different things at MAM. We have a, a dedicated gallery that focuses on contemporary native work, which is the Frost Gallery over here. And then we have a, a dedication in the collection too. So this core group of artwork that is part of the permanent collection that gets um, sent all over the place with frequent requests for loans. The, our partnership with the Montana World Affairs Council and Chris in particularly, um, has been over the past few year, uh, past year, I guess. And I found myself writing about our, our relationship for a grant report recently. And I thought, this is really interesting that we have a contemporary art museum like MAM and the Montana World Affairs Council bringing great talks like this um, on a regular basis. And you really using uh, this relationship as a way to engage current affairs using the lens of contemporary art. And so usually what I do is I, I talk to Chris and I say, this is what we're planning for the next year, um, or these are the exhibitions that are upcoming. Do any of these appeal to you from that lens of current affairs or, or political situations? Can you think about a way that we might partner? And, and he has the wonderful and creative gift of, of suggesting um, really interesting speakers that, that interact with this. And, and he chose Christie's exhibition as the site for this talk. And I think that that's really excellent. We've done a few other ones too, um, the human impact of conflict, which was a panel of bringing together refugees, journalists, and the asylum workers. And then the Ukraine war watershed moment with Heather Ashby 
from the U.S. Institute of Peace and former U.S. Ambassador Robert Loftus, and then uh, Street Politics and Social Movements in Contemporary Iran. And then most recently, Mark Johnson, in partnership with Bacchus Institute, presented um, his new book, The Middle Kingdom Under the Big Sky, Chinese Settlers in Montana. So really a fascinating um, way to present contemporary art and contemporary affairs. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris um, to introduce Tom Countryman. But thank you so much for coming to the Missoula Art Museum and using the museum in this way. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Brandon, and thank you all for coming. I'm Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council. Uh, I want to just amplify and uh, what Brandon said and to thank the staff uh, at MAM. Because Brandon and Nicole and Laura, who couldn't be with us here tonight, uh, have been great partners over the past years. And, and as Brandon mentioned, I mean, it's quite extraordinary. We find this common ground um, and, and we have this beautiful space and this wonderful host who brings us here together so that we can, in comfort, listen and learn from our distinguished speakers. So a sincere thanks to everybody here at the MAM. I also quickly want to thank our very generous sponsors mm -hmm. from the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, Stockman Bank, Clearwater Credit Union, and Humanities Montana. These are the five um, sponsors that help us bring programs like this and many more all across Montana. And speaking of across Montana, that was almost a setup for a joke. Um, but uh, I have to say that, you know, my job it is quite extraordinary. Um, I've had a lot of interesting jobs in my life, but this is by far the most interesting one. Why is that? Well, let me tell you what has been happening over the past few days. Uh, we've put in about 700 miles talking with uh, in, in six different towns, uh, nine different schools, 13 classrooms, 350 kids, Montana kids. And I'm not talking just in Bozeman and Missoula, I'm talking in Gardner, in Sheridan, in Phillipsburg, all the high schools here in town, uh, together with Tom Countryman, who I'll introduce in just a moment, to talk about not just the, the issue of today, but also engaging our Montana kids in the world, helping them see what is going on and how does it affect them? What, you know, how is what is going on in, the, in Ukraine or in Iran or in North Korea affect us here in Montana. And it's quite extraordinary insight that Mr. Countryman has provided these young people. And that's what we do at the World Affairs Council. So for those of you who don't know who we are and what we do, that's a little bit of insight. Uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit um, that is dedicated to engaging Montana citizens and students in issues that affect us, the international issues not just the issue of the day or what's on the headline, but things that actually somehow have a connection to us here in Montana. And Mr. Countryman is gonna help you see very clearly how that actually, how what is happening now has this very strong and direct effect on Montana and Montanans. Brendan mentioned, you know, we have this partnership and we think about how can we use the space and how can we use exhibits to bring these issues together? And when I heard about Christie's work here and I, and I saw it, I thought, you know, it was at the same time I heard what was a kind of familiar sound. It was that sound I hadn't heard in decades. It was a saber rattling. It was a nuclear saber rattling. And I hadn't heard something like that in so long. We've all heard things more recently, the rattling of the Iranian saber or the North Korean one, but it's been so long since we've heard a major nuclear power talk about actually detonating nuclear weapons, and that's Russia. And that happened multiple times in public over the past months. And so it got me thinking, it got us thinking, you know, what's going on here? Because in fact, our public debate and our public discussion on uh, arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation, it's not really been much of a debate like it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yet somehow it's returned. That old familiar sound somehow, unfortunately, has come back. And so we thought, you know, in light of Christie's uh, exhibit here and these extraordinary photographs, in light of the situation, we ought to come and, and try to get somebody to join us here in Montana who can help us understand 
really kind of beyond the headline, beyond that sound bite that you get, what is going on underneath and, and why does it matter? And, and that's why I'm so glad um, that we have uh, invited Tom Countryman here. I'm going to just read a quick biography for those who, who haven't read it already in introduction. Then, Christy, I'm going to hand it over to you to say a few words on, on, on your, your work. But Tom Countryman is currently the board chairman of the Arms Control Association. He served for 36 years as a member of the U.S. Foreign Service, achieving the rank of Minister Counselor. Tom was the Acting Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. So we're very pleased that he could join Christy and all of us here in Montana. Um, what I'm going to do is hand over to you, Christy, and then Tom for your remarks. And know that we'll have some ample time at the end for Q&A and engagement with you. For, so start thinking of your questions now. Christy, over to you. You are, yeah. I'm going to let you do this. I don't know how to do it. Well, hello everyone. I um just to let you know I broke a bone in my foot, and that's why I'm here with my um pedestal waiting for me. Um I would uh, like to just read from an essay I've written about my experience photographing these uh, missile sites outside of um, Great Falls, fairly near Conrad, Montana. Um, I wrote it uh, after I did this two-week job in the fall of 2007 because it was sort of the once-in-a-lifetime job, and I would say there are probably are very few civilians who've gotten inside uh, these facilities, <clears throat> especially with a camera. And um, so I just wrote a diary every night. It was a, it was every day. It was a new uh, eye-opening moment, many moments. So this will just this is an excerpt. The whole essay will appear in the Journal for um, Industrial Archaeology. <laughs> just in case you might be looking in the atomic issue. Um, hasn't been published yet, but this is a piece that will kind of give you um, a little sense of what it is like to be on site at these, in these places when you are a self-described peacenik, as such as myself. Um, <clears throat> Romeo, <clears throat> is one of five missile alert facilities comprising the 564th Missile Squadron out of Nostrum Air Force Base in Great Falls. They are named according to the NATO alphabet, which goes Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, etc. This is lingo I heard on episodes of MASH, which until now has been my only window into anything military. Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, and Tango are the missile alert facilities being de decommissioned, which means missiles will be removed and the installations dismantled. The U.S. Air Force hired me to photograph these facilities as historical examples of the Cold War technology for the Library of Congress. I passed a deep security check that included all my camera equipment to get this contract. On day one, hour one, ground zero of my assignment in Romeo's entry vestibule, I confidently present my ID in per to the person sitting behind bulletproof glass, armed with a clipboard and a semi-automatic weapon. Officer Sean is annoyingly methodical. Your driver's license has the middle initial J and my clearance list has no middle initial. The names don't match. I can't let you in. Officer Sean is the gatekeeper on duty in Romeo's security control center, which serves to protect two missiles 50 feet underground in the launch control capsule, who are responsible for launching as many as 10 nuclear missiles in underground silos at 
separate offsite unmanned launch facilities within a 10 mile radius. Officer Sean can't be too careful. She is guarding nuclear missiles. My understanding of military logic is limited, but I know enough not to argue with her. She has the ultimate ace in the hole. I step away from the bulletproof glass and let Ken, my mandatory handler, handle it. He has the high and tight haircut, no nonsense former military bulldog build needed for this situation, and it's why he's here. I sit on the bench in Romeo's entry vestibule and wait. After a futile, futile exchange with Officer Sean, Ken sits next to me and tells it like it is. There's no love in Romeo today. I feel better. So that was my introduction to trying to get to work. Um, so this section is about going into the launch control capsule, which is this room right here. It's underground. It's below the surface of this missile alert facility which is there basically to protect the missileers who are underground uh, in the room where they are on call to launch a missile, which would be at the launch facilities, which is that photograph over there. Um, and then there's another interior shot over there of the launch facility. So th these are a few of the 90 photographs I took during that two week period. The launch control capsule is the holy of holies, so to speak. The most secure and most difficult place for us to access. Two missileers are locked in the launch control capsule for 24 hour shifts, waiting for the order to launch. Every day, two fresh missileers arrive at 11 a.m. to take over the mission. Above ground, 12 airmen and airwomen live in the missile alert facility for seven day stretches. At any given time of day, at least four crewmen are on duty, guarding access points, carrying assault weapons, mowing the lawn, taking out the garbage, or driving an SUV for routine inspections of the launch facilities. They all look very young to me. Both missileers must be awake, not eating, briefing or debriefing, otherwise, or otherwise busy for us to gain access. We can't enter the launch control center if missileers are in the middle of a personnel changeover. The handoff takes a good hour <clears throat> of protocols that are sacrosanct and cannot be intruded upon. They cannot deny us access without giving a reason. They are guarding nuclear missiles. Ken and I learned that our best chance at getting into the launch control center is between 10 and 11 a.m. before the changeover or right after lunch. When we get the okay, we pass through the security control center under the supervision of someone like Officer Sean. We load my equipment in the elevator and go below. The launch control center resembles the insides of sub inside of submarines I've seen in movies. Tight spaces, curved walls and ceilings, lots of equipment. My camera, lights, extension cord, tripod, and film bag take up a lot of floor space. What if I catch a toe and do a face, face plant in the control console? What if my high watt lights blow a fuse? Instead of voicing these concerns, I silently communicate. I know what I'm doing, and I'm here to do it. The missileers silently communicate. We want you out of here as soon as possible. <laughs> There is no comfortable place for all of us to stand. This kind of pressure is not my friend. Pressure leads to rushing. Rushing leads to errors. I am annoyingly methodical. I have one chance to photograph this launch control center and there is no room for error as these stewards of nuclear warheads know so well. Ken, normally a man of crisp communication, starts shooting the breeze with the missileers. What's with this chit chat? He knows I prefer silence when I'm concentrating on the shot. I finally catch on that he is deploying small talk to put the missileers at ease, relatively speaking, which gives me more breathing room, relatively speaking, to work in cramped quarters. 
We are a team now, Ken and me. Who knew? Missileers wear custom fitted Air Force Blue flight suits. I want Air Force Blue. <laughs> Had to do it. With zip fronts, with a zip front and names on the pocket. Why flight suits? I ask. The clipped reply We are pilots. Technically, we fly missiles. Flight suits remind us of our mission. So where do you sleep? I am suddenly curious about everything. A missileer leads me to the far side of a floor to ceiling island of equipment running lengthwise down the center of the capsule. He stands next to a Pullman style bunk snugged into the curved exterior wall with a crisply pleated Air Force blue curtain across the front. He pulls back the curtain to reveal a pristine ironed white pillow and top sheet turned down over a tightly tucked Air Force blue blanket. I ask him to turn on the reading light. The missileer obliges. The sleeping berth glows immaculate. I resist the impulse to genuflect. I take my time setting up the camera. Under the black cloth, I relax for the first time since entering the launch control center. The air I am breathing seems to come from inside the viewfinder. I compose upside down and backwards on a focusing screen, a missileer's bed for the Library of Congress. Okay. Thank you so much, Christy. That was fascinating. There are so many things familiar to me, even though I have never been inside one of those bunkers. So I want to thank the Missoula Art Museum for hosting us tonight. Thank Christy for this amazing exhibition, which I've been enjoying before and intend to enjoy after this talk. Um, and thank, thank the Montana World Affairs Council uh, for its mission of bringing the world to Montana and bringing Montana to the world and bringing me to Montana. <laughs> I grew up in Washington State, and every month with the Boy Scouts, I was hiking in the Olympics or the Cascades. So to be back among mountains does my heart a world of good, and I thank you for that. Um, I did those 36 years in the Foreign Service, uh, working overseas in five different countries, working in the State Department at the United Nations and the Pentagon and the White House. <clears throat> doing a variety of specializations. But my specialization for the last several years of my career and for the few years that I've now been retired is in nuclear weapons. And while it's not always a cheery topic, I can still find an audience. So I thank you for coming <laughs> tonight. Um, I want to do a little bit of history. Um, I think it's possible that there are one or two people in this room who are as old as me and who may remember, as I do, in, in elementary school in the 1960s, doing duck and cover drills. Uh, if you hear the siren or if you look out the school window and see a mushroom cloud, get under your desk, cover your head. Would this have saved your life? Almost certainly not, but it had a positive effect in this sense. Kids went home and told their parents, this is what we did in school today. Parents, if they walked downtown in most American cities, would see a little black and yellow metal sign on a wall with a radiation symbol saying nuclear fallout shelter this way. People talked about nuclear weapons, the risk of nuclear war, in the 1960s as a matter of course. Reader's Digest, which used to be in one third of all American households, once devoted an entire issue to discussing nuclear weapons. It was in the press, it was in the best movie ever made, Dr. Strangelove, 1964, still, very applicable to today's situation. I recommend it. Um, people talked about it. Um, 
in 1982, the biggest political demonstration in the history of the US took place in Central Park in New York City. More than a million people came out to demand that the United States and the Soviet Union freeze their arsenals, stop producing new nuclear warheads. And all of this had an effect. Ronald Reagan became president in 1981 as a hawk, as hostile to the Soviet Union, but partly because of public interest, partly because of a film in 1983 you may have seen the day after, primarily because he took seriously his job and approached it with an open mind that by the end of his tenure in 1988, he had achieved with the Soviet Union some of the most forward-looking arms control agreements ever that have shaped our world. And it had an effect. In the late 1960s, the U.S. possessed uh, 30,000 nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union in later in the 70s reached almost 40,000 nuclear weapons. Today, as the result, not only of Reagan, but of presidents before and after him, we are at a level where both the US and the Russian Federation each have less than 6,000 nuclear weapons, an 85% reduction the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, and these important arms control agreements, I think gave a lot of Americans a sense that we don't need to talk about it anymore. But the fact is the risk of nuclear war, the existence of the weapons, the readiness of militaries to launch nuclear weapons never ended. The risk that there could be a nuclear conflict at any time is low, but it is not zero. And in my opinion, it is greater in the last few years than it has been previously, than it was, say, five years ago. And I'll talk quickly about those reasons, and then I, I hope we have some time for discussion. The number one thing that I, I think I need to remind American citizens, especially younger citizens, if you have seen war on television lately in Syria or in Ukraine, you've seen bombs falling on cities. And you think, wow, nuclear war would be worse than that. It's not just worse, it is unimaginably worse. A nuclear weapon is between thousands and tens of thousands of times more powerful than any non-nuclear weapon ever devised. Um, and I would encourage you to go to a little site called outrider.org, which has some fascinating interactive exhibits about nuclear issues, climate issues, uh, and uh, for fun, not out of meanness, believe me, today I went to their site, entered in Missoula, and said, what are the effects of a 300 kiloton weapon dropped in the center of Missoula? The answer is 40,000 deaths, 20,000 injuries from one single weapon. 300 kilotons is the standard issue nuclear weapon in both the US and the Russian arsenals. It is 20 times more powerful than the weapon that the US used in Hiroshima in 1945. And it would have absolutely devastating effect. I don't think I need to convince all of you that the difference between a nuclear war and anything you've seen in Ukraine is difficult for any human being to imagine. 300 kilotons is standard size. The United States has on active deployment more than 1,500 such weapons on, in missiles, on submarines, ready to load onto aircraft, mostly aimed 
at Russian territory, Russia has the same number of 300 kiloton weapons deployed, mostly aimed at United States territory. What are the factors that cause me to say that the risk is higher than in recent years? Um, I'll list several of them. I'll only go into detail on maybe one, and, and then you can ask me more about it later. Um, one is that there are at this moment more flashpoints, more points of potential conflict than there were in recent years. Obviously, Ukraine is one. Obviously, Taiwan is another. But so is the India-Pakistan border. So is the zone between North Korea and South Korea. A second factor is that I find it hard to have confidence in the nine men, and of course they are all men, who have their fingers on nuclear buttons today. I'd like to show photographs of Boris Johnson, Bibi Netanyahu, Kim Jong-un, Macron, Trump, or Biden, ask people, how many of these people do you trust to do the right thing in a crisis? And the usual audience answer is less than three on average. That's a worry. There is a worry because I think the risk is higher because there is again discussion of something that in a way we stop discussing. And that is the concept of limited nuclear war. The Russians have a number of, quote, smaller nuclear weapons that are intended to stop any NATO invasion of Russia. And they think about the possibilities, the scenarios in which they might use them. And that obliges us to think about it too. It is the job of military planners to think about almost unthinkable situations. It's their job, it's responsible. <clears throat> At the same time, just thinking about those plans makes it more likely that someone will implement those plans, whether on the Russian or the United States side or the Chinese side for that matter. And the problem with that is that in all the war games, either top secret or kind of open war games that have ever been conducted, Almost all of them go from a limited nuclear war to an all out nuclear war between superpowers. So just thinking about limited nuclear war makes it more likely that we will have an unlimited nuclear war. Um, and the last of the general reasons I'm concerned is that an arms control architecture that the US helped to create and build up over many years is in disrepair and decay. Uh, the United States and Russia have either mutual agreement or one side or the other ended some of the most important agreements ever made. The anti-ballistic missile treaty that Nixon negotiated with Brezhnev in 1972. President Bush withdrew from that in 2002. The Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement, probably the most important thing that Reagan and Gorbachev did. Uh, Russia violated, the US pushed Russia to end the violation. President Trump withdrew from the treaty uh, four years ago. The Iran nuclear agreement, which Iran was honoring, was withdrawn by the Trump administration. The last important arms control agreement still in place is the New START Treaty between Russia and the United States, negotiated in 2010. It expires in February of 2026. Russia has already begun to end its compliance. And if that is allowed to expire without a replacement, for the first time in 50 years, there will be no limits set on the arsenals of either the United States or Russia. So all of these things 
make me assess that although I can't assign a number, <clears throat> it is, as I say, greater than zero, and it is greater than it was just a few years ago. The issue that a lot of audiences I speak to is are most interested in is what is the likelihood that Russia could use a nuclear weapon in its conflict, its invasion of Ukraine? And the answer is, I think, <clears throat> again, to be nice and nebulous, uh, it is not zero, but it is uh, low, and it worries me. So put it this way, uh, Russia used to be more of a superpower. It used to have interests in many foreign policy areas. Today, Russia has one foreign policy goal, success in Ukraine. And Russia has one asset, one characteristic that makes it still worthy of being called a superpower. It's not its economy. It's not its example of being a worker's paradise. It is its possession of a nuclear arsenal. So you can expect, and we have expected Putin to use that arsenal to achieve success in Ukraine. But what does use of a nuclear arsenal mean? Using your nuclear weapons is not only firing them off so they explode, threatening to use your weapons, reminding people you have these weapons. These are ways in which both Russia and the United States have used nuclear arsenals in the past with very little success. The fact that the U.S. possesses nuclear weapons did not give us victory in Vietnam or in Afghanistan. They did not give the Russians victory in Afghanistan. They did not give France or Britain the power to hold on to their colonial possessions. It is such a ridiculously blunt instrument that it is a power that is almost counterproductive. Still, you understand why Putin thinks it has to be used in this circumstance. And so we've seen him go through the checklist. How can I use my possession of nuclear weapons to frighten Europeans enough that they stop sending weapons to Ukraine? He started as soon as he invaded last year saying, don't try to stop us, we have nuclear weapons. More statements of that sort, we, we, we are ready to use all weapons at our disposal to defend our interests. Then he talks about sending, basing nuclear weapons in another country, Belarus. Then he stops complying with the inspection and verification provisions of the New START Treaty. He still has a few steps left. He could, for example, conduct an underground nuclear test, which neither Russia nor the United States have done in the last 30 years. He could shoot a small, quote unquote, nuclear weapon off in an unpopulated area to demonstrate he's serious. He's got a few more steps. I think he knows, and I think even his spectacularly incompetent generals know, that actually detonating a nuclear weapon in Ukraine will work against him. It won't give him any military advantage. The fallout all blows east into Russia, and the few friends and bystanders around the world turn against Russia. So I think rationally he's not going to go there, but we may see these other steps intended to frighten Europe, Europeans, and Americans. Am I utterly convinced of his rationality? No, nobody can be. Nobody knows what's in his head. People will be writing psychoanalyses of Vladimir Putin the next hundred years. 
We have seen in history before leaders who believe themselves to be the most brilliant men on earth, infallible, humiliated in battle or some other way. But I don't think we've ever seen such a person humiliated who at the same time had nuclear weapons at his disposal. Is he suicidal? Is he messianic? Is he that crazy and spiteful? I doubt it, but I'm not sure. And that's why I still worry about it. Although I'm worried, it is absolutely the right thing to do to not be intimidated by his nuclear threats. Because if he succeeds with those threats in causing Europe and the US to back off support for Ukraine, it will not be the last time he does it. And it will be not be the last time another country, whether North Korea or India and Pakistan or China, uses the same tactic. I've got no easy answers for today, but I'll uh, try to uh, end in a moment with a little bit of optimism. I do want to say a word about Montana specifically. Uh, you've seen these photographs, which are brilliant, uh, about the 100 plus missile silos in Montana. They are the biggest chunk of 300 silos spread across four states, many fewer than we had years ago when the silo field stretched as far east as Arkansas. In each of those silos, there is a uh, three-stage rocket, a missile. Uh, they all have to have not just the title ICBM, they have to have a good name. These are the Minutemen 3. The U.S. is in the process of replacing these 40-year-old missiles, not because they don't work, but because they're 40 years old. And if you have a 40-year-old dishwasher or a car, you're going to replace it. The cost is about $100 billion to build 600 new missiles, 300 to fill these silos, 300 in reserve. The total cost to sustain those missiles over their projected lifetime of 50 years is $264 billion, a quarter of a trillion. And that's only about 15% of the almost two trillion dollars that the U.S. will spend in the next 30 years building new missiles, submarines, and aircraft, and sustaining the operational status of the nuclear warheads themselves. So it's big money. And uh, I can't tell you what to think about it. On the one hand, Montana, as it always has done, supports America's security, America's national defense. And this is a real life contribution to that. On another hand, does it mean that Montana, willingly or not, is part of a global nuclear arms race? Does it mean that because these weapons are aimed at Russia, that they become the first targets of a Russian attack. In other words, is, has Montana volunteered to absorb Russian missiles that otherwise would fly to Seattle or Chicago or New York? Um, here's what I do think about it. I line up with William Perry, who was Secretary of Defense 25 years ago, a physicist, somebody who knows more about nuclear weapons than any other Secretary of Defense we've had, who says these had their place in our national strategy. Today, they are destabilizing. The chance that they would be launched as a result of a false alarm is higher than the chance that they will serve their original purpose to prevent a sudden all-out Russian attack on the United States. And I tend to agree with him on that. 
the minimum I hope to see is that the president reviews as new missiles are deployed, the current launch on warning status that's sometimes inaccurately called hair trigger alert. Launch on warning is not hair trigger alert, but it is what makes these missiles destabilizing rather than stabilizing in any crisis between the US and Russia. And I'm happy to talk more uh, about the Montana angle in particular. No easy answers for what we can do. Um, but in the long run, in, uh, what kind of keeps me going is the fact that we have a history in which the United States stumbling as always, getting things wrong sometimes, has over the decades gotten a lot of things right. By demonstrating leadership, vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and Russia, and vis-a-vis -vis the entire international community, by taking initiatives that reduce risk, reduce arsenals, make the world safer, we made a lot of progress from the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis up until recently. And the US can again exert that kind of leadership. We had every president from the 1950s forward, except for one, who believed that arms control is a contribution to national security. It protects Americans. It's not a favor we do for adversaries. And it does not require us to like or to trust the people we negotiate with. It does require us to have a clear vision of what reduces risk. In the very short term, right now, President Biden is with six other world leaders in Hiroshima for a meeting of the G7. Uh, any time now, maybe right about now, they will issue a joint statement that will be a hundred paragraphs. I don't know anybody who will read it all, but there will be a section on nuclear weapons and arms control. Uh, and in fact, seven years ago, the last time that meeting was in Japan, I was the one who was negotiating with the other six. What are we going to say about nuclear weapons in this? I don't know, but I hope that there will be not just the standard uh, least common denominator statements, but some forward thinking visionary statements among the seven that will give some hope to those who believe we can continue to use arms control to reduce risk. I hope that President Biden will make his own statement because he thought about these issues longer than any president we've ever had. At the minimum, I know that the G7 leaders are gonna do two things that I wish every person in the world could do, just to visit the museum at Ground Zero in Hiroshima to understand the actual effect of nuclear weapons and to talk to the Hibakusha, that is the survivors of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that I'll wake up tomorrow to a somewhat more uplifting vision than I've been able to give you tonight. Last word is a short advertisement. Uh, First, for the Montana World Affairs Council, which is deserving of your support. I've spoken to many World Affairs Councils in the past. None of them have ever taken me out on the road to speak to high schools. And I have found that the most rewarding thing of this week. So thank you, Chris. The council deserves your support. My little organization, the Arms Control Organiz uh, Association, also would love your support. Please go to armscontrol.org. Uh, look at our resources that will tell you everything you want to know on arms control issues ranging from Iran, North Korea to Russia, China, chemical weapons, bioweapons, 
Uh, and join us two weeks from today. We are having our annual meeting. You can watch online. And I'll be introducing our keynote speaker. That is the president's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, who is going to follow up the Hiroshima meeting with a statement about where the White House intends to go on arms control in the future. So that's armscontrol.org. Um, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank Christy for her life's work for these amazing photographs. And I hope that both of us can answer any questions or react to any comments that you have. Thanks.